In this video, I'm going to show you some techniques and strategies in order to get through Final Fantasy 1 just a little faster so you can breeze through it and have more time to do other things and have some sweet bragging rights too. Be warned, these strategies completely contradict normal walkthroughs that you'll find anywhere on the internet. Actually, I know I said that there were three ways to cut playtime shorter, but I've really got four. And it all starts with you picking your initial party in the beginning of the game. Traditionally, Final Fantasy 1 automatically picks an initial party for you. And all over the place, you'll find different challenges that require different setups, such as the solo white mage challenge. And some people swear by using a mix of warriors and mages to get through the game without too much damage. But the strategy I'll present to you today is just a little bit different. You can shave a ton of time off the game by beginning the game with four monks. While this makes the end game just a tiny bit trickier, it can absolutely still be done. But here's how you can take up to 20 to 30 minutes off of your game timer with this party. With four monks, immediately go into the menu and look at your equipment. Notice your attack stat and your defense stat with your initial equipment. Now common sense tells us to run into town and buy some better stuff, but I say nay, fellow returners. Completely unequip everything. Notice your attack doesn't change, but your defense actually increases. You don't even have to level up. You can run straight to Garland and give him an entire platter of knuckle sandwiches, all while never having to break a sweat. And if you choose to continue the game with this party, your monks will be naked for the entire thing. They just perform better that way. Can I, can I say that on YouTube? Naked? Well, with this strategy, you and your naked monks will just need a ton of healing and buffing items with all the gill you've saved by not buying equipment or spells throughout the game. Who's these hunks? Speaking of not spending gill on spells, that's actually the second strategy. Uh, well, kind of. See, in Final Fantasy 1, magic spells can very quickly become insanely expensive. I mean, just look at the price for this spell. And if you've already emptied your wallet on getting the best equipment of the game, which can also add up pretty quickly, your spellcasters will be lacking severely, causing them to perform at a subpar level. And to make matters worse, you won't have any extra money to put towards items that heal status effects either. And you need those antidotes, I promise you. Well, there's a stupid simple tip. Just don't buy spells that you don't need. It seems like an obvious premise, but years ago I read a Japanese strategy guide that advised a player not to buy any spells yet in the town of Provoka. And I was mystified at the thought of it. I always just filled my spell list for the sake of completion anytime there was a magic shop around. But you don't have to. There's already enough grinding in this game, especially the NES and Origins version. And not just experience grinding either. A lot of time you'll be farming for guild too. The thing that I never thought about was after you get the airship you can always come back and buy any spells you miss. Also if you want to take more time off using the same idea, when you get the mystic key after waking up the prince in Elfheim, don't immediately go back and find all those chests yet. Wait until after you've leveled up a bit or even at the end of the game to absolutely breeze through the marsh cave to get everything. This next strategy doesn't have anything to do with the pixel remaster of the game as Square completely cut this part out. But in every other version of the game, once you reach a decently fair level, say around 22 or so, if you travel to the ice cavern and get all the way back to where you found the Levistone, or floater in the NES version, which is just an awful word for the item, Levistone is much better. Anyway, on the tile right before the Levistone, there's an enemy called Evil Eye that you can continually get into battle with for huge amounts of experience and gill. If you spend even an hour doing this, bring plenty of healing items for this part alone. You can get your party ready to take on chaos at any time. In the pixel remaster, Evil Eye is still there, but you can't reuse the spawn point as the battle is connected to collecting the Levistone. The same way that monsters are sometimes inside treasure chests and you have to defeat that enemy to get the item inside. It's the same premise. As for the bonus fourth strategy I promised in the opening of this video, it just takes a little bit of out of the box thinking. Do you remember that part of the game when you just finished the Terra Cavern and then you take your ship across the world to get to Crescent Lake where the sage gives you the canoe? He tells you immediately to go to the volcano, but you don't have to. In fact, I say don't. With the canoe in your possession, go ahead and make your way to the ice cavern to get the airship. This can cut tons of time off the game, especially if you go ahead and do the Citadella Trials to get the rat tail for class changes. This ultimately means now with the new classes, with the bigger majority of the game still left, if you level up with the new classes you get slightly bigger increases to your stats, thus making everything from that point just a little easier. Also the enemies in the ice cavern give you more experience in guild than the volcano does, so now you can go ahead and head to the caravan to get the bottled fairy and some buffing items that will make you virtually unstoppable. Merilith will go down in no time now. Oh, by the way, did you know that Square Enix very quietly might have announced the pixel remasters coming to Switch? Click this video here and I'll explain it all. I mean, you've got some time now to watch it since you beat Final Fantasy 1 so fast. 